Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how this virus has been evolving and how um, I mean, it's evolving right now. So um, as you probably know, um, coronaviruses, they have two main ways of uh, evolution. The first way is just mutations. And one of the, I mean, you do at the back of the envelope calculation with the mutation rate that they have and the evolutionary rates. And you get basically one substitution every uh, couple of weeks. So uh, every time that this virus is infecting a person, um, I mean, every two persons, because it's roughly taking like a five days, you get one mutation. So this is what is allowing us, is basically you can track basically the evolution of the virus all around the world. This is from, from G8. This is one of the largest databases that there are from uh, uh, viral sequences that are collected right now in the world. And here is a phylogenetic tree. So um, on the uh, y, uh, x axis is time where the different viruses, they were isolated. And they are colored here by the location, so the country of origin. And you can realize just um, looking here at this, at this plot is that there are different clades. So the virus is diversifying and viruses in different places of the world. And, they're, and they look different. I mean, there are a few mutations that are separating one virus from another one. And you can see, for example, that in blue, the first ones, they're all in blue, and these are the Asian countries. I mean, mostly China, most of them coming from there. The red cluster that is in the middle, this is basically all American. This is the West Coast. This is one virus that is uh, circulating in the West Coast. And then um, the yellow green is basically the viruses that are circulating in Europe in different places. I mean, there are different clades. They are quite mixed. There are different clades in Europe circulating and here also. I mean, you can see red dots that they're uh, uh, populating in this tree in different places. And this is because there are many, many introductions of the virus in different populations. Um, they are not, there is not a lot of data from New York, but I mean, we have a lot of data from, from, from the US and they are basically mixing of all these viruses going around. So, um, I mean, this is one of the first ways of mutation, of uh, evolution of, the, of, the, of, this, um, of this virus. The other one is recombination. And um, uh, recombination happens when there is a co-infection of two different viruses. I mean, in this cartoon, it's a red virus and a green virus. They co-infect in the same cell and they generate a chimera at the end where part of the genome is red and part of the genome is green. So this is quite interesting. And this is quite pervas pervasive in viruses, in coronaviruses in particular. And uh, that uh, allows the virus to acquire quickly some abilities. And I'm going to describe one of these abilities that the uh, ancestor of this virus has acquired in the recent evolution. So um, where is this uh, virus coming from? So the first thing that, as you probably know, the first outbreak was reported at the end of uh, December in Wuhan. The virus was sequenced very quickly. And in two weeks, we have the virus. It was public. And uh, you can start playing with the genome of the virus and trying to, to understand where is this coming from. One of the first papers, this is one of the first papers in, in The Lancet that was published. And they took the whole genome and compared with other viruses that are around. And this is a type of virus that is called beta coronaviruses. And there are different kinds of coronaviruses. And um, you can uh, hear um, the new virus is, is the one in the middle, marking red, that is called 2009 and COVID, COV, that is the virus that is causing COVID. It's the first notation. Now the, the official notation that most people are taking is SARS-CoV-2. And you can see that all the viruses, they are basically identical, suggesting that there's a common origin. Also, the other thing that you can do with the timing is that you can just put a time of what is the, the common ancestor to all these viruses. And this time is around November of 2019. So it was very close to the first cases reported in, in, in beginning of December. So this is a very, very recent virus. It's a single introduction. So at least all the viruses that we have, they are coming from a single introduction. They're all quite similar. They are diversifying. And they are related to many other coronaviruses, in particular, a type of viruses that are called serpicoviruses. This is subgenus with the, uh, with the coronaviruses, the beta coronaviruses, that is containing mostly bat viruses, viruses found in, in bat, uh, mostly in China, there are many in Asia, and also the other human uh, virus that is the SARS, uh, that was uh, SARS-CoV, that is the virus that was given the outbreak in 2002, 2003 of, uh, of SARS. These two viruses, as you can see here in the stream, uh, I don't know if uh, the, pointing, uh, the pointer works. This is the, uh, the Wuhan outbreak, and this is the SARS uh, virus. And you can see here that they are kind of distant in some way. But I'm going to tell you that this is not true. It depends on how you look at the, at the genome. Most of the other viruses, they are uh, viruses that they are circulating in bats. So we know, I mean, the main hypothesis, and I think it's the hypothesis of most people at the moment, is that they have been a big repertoire. I mean, if you sample bats, you can get a huge amount of coronaviruses, I mean, different coronaviruses, but also 
a lot of recombinations. So the bats, they look like a mixing vessel where this is a cocktail of different viruses that they are mixing there and they generating all these things. They have been uh, small outbreaks also kind of uh, reported, but these are basically the, the main two, SARS and, 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 the, and the COVID outbreak. So um, one of the th first things that you can do is trying to see if you take the whole genome and trying to see if using this data from the beta coronaviruses, if they have been very rec uh, recombinations. So um, you can do uh, these things very easily. You take the genome of different uh, viruses and you can try to see if they're regions in the genome that they are closer than you, you will expect by, by random chance. And here on the, on the panel, on the top panel, um, these are recombination events that we've found in the Vita coronaviruses. And, um, and this is the whole genome. And in particular here, shaded in, in gray, uh, is the spike protein. And in, in green is the um, receptor binding domain that I'm going to explain a little bit more. This is kind of the port of entry where the virus is entering the cell and is determining in, in huge part, uh, basically the host uh, range of the, of the virus. So um, these viruses, they recombine everywhere in the genome, but there are some particular regions that are a little bit more recombinant in some way, or they, are this, they have more recombinations. We don't know if this is due to selection or this is uh, due to some intrinsic mechanism. And here is the beginning, if you just plot kind of a Manhattan plot, and this is the lower part, where we can see um, the different recombinations. This is what you will expect by random, the, uh, and this uh, red line. And what you see is that there is many more recombinations happened in the beginning of this region that is involving all the beginning of the spike protein. The same is happening if you just take some particular subspecies, by the way, I can also mention. So this is also related to MERS in some way. MERS is not a cervical virus, it's in, in, in a different type, it's a beta coronavirus. And there are two other viruses that are circulating in humans, that they are common coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses, that um, they are called HQU1 and OC43. They are circulating in humans, and we have data from uh, previous years that these viruses, how these infections they look, li uh, look like. Um, so um, this is the, and the thing that you can start doing. You can just look at the tree, and what happens if you just take the, these trees, and instead of taking the whole genome, you just take different genes or different sections of the genome. And one of the best things for looking for recombinations are what they are called topological inconsistencies. So you just take a, a tree and then you draw the, the tree with all the different branches and all these things. And then you take a different region of the genome and then you get a different tree. And um, then you can do some statistics and trying to see if you, uh, if you find something there that is important or not. And one of the things that is interesting is that the virus that was originating SARS in 2003 and this uh, SARS-CoV-2 of COVID, they're in different kind of branches between the cervical viruses, if you take the whole genome. But if you just take the receptor binding domain, the region that is determining uh, basically here, the entering point of, of the cell, they are very similar. They are much closer than one, one should expect. And there was an, a, a recombination that happened, and this is, uh, I think, the main uh, explanation. There is a recombination where these two viruses in this region, in the receptor binding domain, then become very, very closely related. So this is another way of representing these things. This is called Tanglegram. And these are, uh, first, you just take the, the phylogeny of the whole genome, so the phylogenetic tree. And this is the, in the receptor binding domain. These are uh, mostly their bat species. I mean, species that, of viruses that are found in bats. There are a few of those that they have been uh, recently um, um, uh, sequenced in, in pangolins that are uh, interesting, but I don't think they are given much more information. And in particular, these things, what one can see is that um, the tree on the genome is different from the T and the tree that you get from the receptor binding domain, the one that is determining the entrance of the virus to the, to the cell. And there is a jump where the SARS-CoV and the SARS-CoV-2, so the virus that was giving rise to SARS and the virus that was giving rise to, to COVID, they are becoming much more similar to, to these things. And they are becoming similar also to the pangolins. There. The other thing that you can do, because we have these clocks, I mean, we have this idea that how these mutations work. If you just take the receptor binding domain, you can just start doing um, timing of when these events happened. And here is, uh, if you just take only the receptor binding domain, so this region, and one of the things that we can see is that the SARS outbreak, uh, sorry, the SARS and the, the COVID outbreak, the one that is now, this virus is related to, to one virus in this particular region, not in the rest of the genome, to, um, to one virus that was circulating in a pangolin that was isolated um, last year, I think, in Guangdong. And the common ancestor to all these two viruses, it was from 2016, so very recent. 
So uh, the closest ancestor in the whole genome is a virus that is circulating in, uh, that was isolated in bats in, in Yunnan, in the south of China, and in 2013. And the common ancestor of this one with uh, the SARS-CoV-2, it was in 2010. And then you can just go uh, back and you can estimate, for example, that in this particular region, where it's very similar to SARS, these, uh, these viruses diverges in, in, in 1997. There's a big error bars. These are the error bars that happen here. So this can give you a time of events of how these um, uh, viruses accumulate mutations and reassortments to, to get to, to what we have now. So this is kind of a cartoon summarizing um, the results. So they are basically, if you take the whole genome, and they are basically two different branches, one in the cervicoviruses, one that contains SARS, and the other one uh, containing the COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2, and they are related to viruses circulating in bats and some viruses circulating in pangolins, these ones. Um, probably um, some a year so ago. All the time is up. Okay, then um, 10 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, there was a recombination between these two viruses, and basically the SARS, the ancestor of SARS-CoV-2, the new ones, took the receptor binding domain for something that is very much similar to SARS that enabled to infect humans. And in addition, there were additional mutations that we call lineage specific mutations that are able to uh, adapt in this virus. And this virus has high, and this uh, receptor has higher affinity than SARS-CoV-2 to bind to the, to the receptor to ACE2. We explored this, some of these mutations and what can be the role of these particular mutations in the recent evolution of the adaptation into humans of this virus. And basically what we're uh, proposing, I think it's kind of, um, kind of a reasonable hypothesis of how this appeared, is that basically in, um, like 15 years ago, there was a recombination that and they were um, the ancestor of the SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID virus, pick up a region of the genome that uh, enabled to, to bind to a this 2 receptor in humans or very close by, very similar to what was doing SARS. And then they were fine, and there were other mutations that were lineage specific that were refining this interaction, the whole thing. So I, I have another thing to, to talk about, but probably I don't have the time here. So, um, yeah, these are basically. Uh, we're, we're running, we're running a little bit out of time. Some people at Colombia, and I want to mention also collaborators here at Colombia, Sagi Shapira, Donna Farber, Jeff uh, Shaman, that we have been doing a lot of sequencing, longitudinal sequencing of viruses in Manhattan, and also from Harvard University, Mohammed Al Qureshi. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. If you can stop sharing so that the next speaker can load, I think it's Jing Yeo Ju, um, unless I'm mistaken. Um, it's, yeah, Jing Yeo. Um, and if there are any questions, <laughs> I'll be happy to uh, let people address them. So I see uh, Evalio. Yes. Even off, I'm at the microbiology department. Uh, Raul, I noticed on your uh, SARS tree that most of the bad viruses there were coming from China, but there was only one coming from Bulgaria. Actually, I'm Bulgarian. Uh, I guess I, I'm just just wondering: uh, is this just a squish of the types of sequences that we have now? Just yeah, th there is there is a very strong biases in in the sampling. I mean, in China they have been and they have I mean uh, very nice programs that they are kind of uh, collecting bats and their papers because from the SARS outbreak, it was becoming clear that bats could play in a very important role, and they have been many many papers. I mean, since two thousand three till now. I mean, there were some recent ones from last year that they found many combinations that were uh, of viruses in circulating in bats in China. They are very similar to what the SARS type viruses that can infect humans have. And um, and they are very interesting. They have a program there, and I'm not sure that there is a similar programs elsewhere. And then the second part is so looking in the future. So now obviously this virus is everywhere, right? So are people doing sequencing in other animals or things like so? This recombination can possibly continue occurring with other in other species. I'm not sure why bats are, are the bats specifically. Uh, good, but let's say, I don't know, in dogs or cats or things like that. Is that yeah, there is, I mean, there is this hypothesis. I mean, as you probably know, I mean, the main hypothesis or one of the main hypotheses for um, these viruses in the SARS outbreak in 2003 was uh, through an intermediate species. So, um, and one of the things that we discussed there in the preprint, uh, that if, if you want more details there, 
is that uh, the bats, I mean, it seems to be using kind of different, uh, there are some mutations that are specific, more specific to humans than to bats. So, but there are some other species, and this is why people got interested in pangolins and, and some of uh, palm civets and all these things. There, there, kind of, there could be some uh, species in the middle. So in 2003 and 2004, people went to these live markets and then they were sampling the animals that they were there. And, and they, they saw that some of these animals, they were infected with these viruses that were very similar to humans. There was a very interesting paper in 2004 where there was a restaurant, I think it was someplace in Wandong, and then two people got a SARS, very similar to SARS virus. This was already when the SARS uh, virus disappeared in 2003. And then two people got very sick with that. They went to the restaurant and they saw that they were kind of palm civets in, in the entrance alive. So they sequence the, 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 the virus from the, from, the, from the people. They look at the, at the, at the palm civets and they, were, they, were, they contain the virus. So it seems that these viruses, they can be circulating in some of these live markets and they can jump into humans. So uh, we don't know, and it's still in speculation. There is a very nice paper also, I think Ian Lipkin is in, an author in the paper in, in Nature Medicine, talking about how these recent mutations that lead to a, a higher um, affinity in the receptor, where do they happen? If they have an intermediate species or they happened in humans, it, it was not detected. We don't have any evidence for the second, I would say. So I would ask the, the speakers to try to um, maintain the, the answer to be short because we have uh, several uh, questions now, Lucy Zhu, maybe last question, then we have to move on to Jingu's presentation. Um, yeah, hi. I'm sorry this is a stupid question, but um, on social media, there has been concerns about um, the COVID virus sort of maybe uh, recom recombining with the SARS virus, especially in people who might be asymptomatic and might still harbor the SARS virus. Can you just talk about that? Like, is that even possible? Yes, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, um, these viruses, especially the beta coronaviruses, we see a lot of recombination, internal recombination. So, um, of uh, different things. I mean, most of these recombinations, my guess, they are going to be unsuccessful because they are kind of distant viruses. If you look at the, at the trees, they are pr pretty distant. So my guess is that it's not very easy to make something that works between these two. But we see a lot of recombinations that happen in beta coronaviruses. And um, I would not be surprised this, uh, Kind of in the future there could be some recombinations we don't know how i mean uh, if this is happening i think most of recombinations that we found there in bats because they are very heavily infected with all these viruses and there is a big load and diversity there that i mean contributes to this diversity in humans i mean we have only like two beta coronaviruses that are circulating in humans and then this is the, the new one SARS is no longer circulating in humans so i think um we don't know i mean the diversity is much lower in humans i'm not sure 